Welcome to Channels Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka from our bureau here in London. On today's show, Britain's taxpayer-funded national broadcaster, the BBC, has been engulfed in a huge crisis this week over alleged sexual misconduct allegations involving one of its most prominent on-screen news anchors, Hugh Edwards. Our business correspondent, Simon Pusey, will be joining me shortly to unravel the truth behind a story that has shocked the nation and left the future of the British institution in question and the 13th edition of the African Achievers Awards will be taking place in the House of Lords this weekend. The ceremony celebrates excellence on the continent by recognising notable individuals and organisations across multiple industries. Toby Akerele, the CEO of Giddy Real Estate Investment Limited, is one of those individuals being recognised and I'll be catching up with him shortly. Then later I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. But first, Nigeria's debt management office has announced that the country has redeemed a $500 million euro bond issued in July 2013. The redemption is expected to vastly improve Nigeria's debt sustainability and reduce the burden of servicing the debt. A euro bond is an international debt instrument that is denominated in a currency not native to the country where it's issued. It's hoped that the repayment will positively impact Nigeria's creditworthiness and borrowing costs. Separately, the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, has been in the spotlight this week, following the appointment of Nigeria President Bola Ahmed Tinubu as its chairman over the next 12 months. The bloc, which spans a region of 5.2 million square kilometres, is considered one of the pillars of the African Economic Community, and the union has a mandate to raise the living standards of its people. Senator Kechi Justina Nwaogu, a former ECOWAS Member of Parliament and the former chair of the Nigeria and Senate Committee on Banking caught up with me from Abuja to discuss her hopes for Tinubu's tenure. Nigeria actually finances up to 65 to 75% of all ECOWAS uh, uh, expenses. And uh, it would be good if Nigeria business men and women and vice versa, the other member states, could have uh, ease of doing business amongst these 15 member states. And it is expected that it would dovetail to the other uh, states of the African continent. As we speak today, you might wish to know that um, ECOWAS business integration is between amongst, amongst each state is less than 10%. It's less than 10%. And we need that with the present, Mr. President now being the chairman for the next 12 weeks, and him being a Democrat, him being an achiever, him being somebody whom we have his track record, it is expected, and I do know that there will be, there will be a lot of improvement, there will be a lot of integration, which is uh, what the, one of the sole uh, purposes of having um, uh, uh, an economic bloc such as uh, uh, ECOWAS. Let's remain with Nigerian news, but bring the conversation back here to Britain, where on Wednesday evening, the Royal African Society hosted the launch of Reclaiming the Jewel of Africa, a best-selling book by Nigeria's former Minister of Finance, Olusegun Aganga. During the star-studied event, which took place at SOAS University, the chartered accountant, who was once a managing director at Goldman Sachs, shared an insider account of how to take Nigeria and Africa from potential to prosperity. In conversation with with journalist Nick Cotton. Channel's Business Global was granted exclusive access. I think it was what I saw when I was in government, that I, I realized the, the great potential Nigeria had, uh, or have. Uh, when, you, when you have a country, as I said earlier, that, ha that has maybe 44, uh, 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 um, four, 44 solid mirrors in commercial quantity, 84 million hectares of land where almost everything can be grown and they continue as a top 10 or top 15 oil and gas producer which the sort of human resources we have in Nigeria and in the industrial we deserve to be one of the pro most prosperous nations in the world and there's and the idea was and, and the question is what's stopping us from being that and when you speak to a number of people you hear some, some might say, oh, it's, it's about leadership. Others might say, oh, it's just about corruption. 
But having been there, having been privileged to be a former finance minister of the country, a former chairman of the economic uh, management team of the country, and a former minister of industry, trade and investment, I know that it's far much more than just leadership and uh, corruption. There's a lot, a lot of things we need to do to get right. And there's no one book anywhere that actually summarizes all the things we need to do, how we get to that promised land, which, which I know we can get to. So the idea is to put something together that focuses not only on talking about the issues, but on the solutions. And make sure that the solutions are practical and you focus on the causes as opposed to the symptoms. When we first started writing it, it looked like a textbook. Um, felt like a textbook. We tried to make it a lot easier for people to read and understand. We brought in a number of anecdotes and all that to make it very interesting. And that made the book a, a, a bit more readable. But everyone I speak to now tell me, when we read this book, we underline pages. We take notes when we're reading this book. Um, everyone I've spoken to, when, you know, so I think it's a book that you need to have in universities, it's a book you need to have in libraries and all that, but more importantly for the policymakers who need to take action. You can't fault this government in terms of what they have done so far. In fact, I think most people have been pleasantly surprised. And so what you want to see is that momentum maintained, because what we are running, we are running a marathon not a hundred year race. So, very good start, but we want to maintain that momentum. And I think if we do that, we'll get a lot of people from out there who will be ready to support and help them. And as I say, I intend to get some of these recommendation solutions to the government so that they can at least see what they can do. Uh, uh, you know, hopefully, they'll find some of the uh, solutions interesting. So, it's, it's our country. And whether my belief and what I've always said is that you can make change, you can make a difference whether you are in or outside government. You shouldn't, we, it's, it's, we all stakeholders and we benefit from what you call the sovereign goodwill. If Nigeria does wait today, you and I will walk with our heads held high anywhere in the world. So we must all play a role in making Nigeria great. And if Nigeria rises, Africa would be great. I think in a way, you know, we cover so much of Africa with our platforms, with African arguments, with, it's an ongoing discussion. I think it's undeniable like how Lord Hastings opened the whole night saying how Africa is growing more than anywhere else and Mr. Aganga as well is claiming the same. So I'm very optimistic and, and we all are here at, at RAS. RAS has been going for 120 years always providing kind of space for business and politics and economics and to to share these things and yes there's a long way to go but i'm certain we're in the right direction it's a brilliant book so i am um, i actually wrote something around um, i tweeted about this book a few weeks ago whilst i was in the middle of reading it and one of the things it felt like was having a conversation with my nigerian father and actually filled a lot of gaps for me in terms of my knowledge and understanding of what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in Africa, and what's needed most importantly, just like Mr. Ganga said. Let's change gears now to focus on a story that has dominated the front pages of UK newspapers over the past seven days. Hugh Edwards, one of Britain's most familiar and well-regarded newsreaders, is, according to a statement from his wife, the BBC presenter at the centre of a scandal that began over allegations in the Sun newspaper about explicit photos he allegedly sent to a young person. For 20 years, Hugh Edwards anchored the BBC's flagship News at 10 programme, watched by millions each weeknight for the latest on the day's news. In a statement on his behalf, Edwards' wife, Vicky Flynn, confirmed he was the presenter involved and said he was in hospital after a serious mental health episode. This latest scandal follows several high-profile crises at the BBC. The broadcaster's public funding model in the UK rightly leads to scrutiny of the network and those who work for it. It also raises criticism of the licence fee, its output, and of the BBC's dominant position in the UK media landscape. I called up with our business correspondent Simon Pusey for an update on this developing story.
Simon, once again, another extraordinary week uh, for the tabloids here in the United Kingdom. Not politics, not Partygate, not the economy, but the BBC. The BBC has been at the centre of its own story. Talk to us about all of the revelations. Yeah, well, it, whenever the BBC um, comes under the spotlight and scrutiny like it has done, it's magnified a hundredfold because it is public license fee paid. So this is not some kind of private broadcaster that um, is paid by advertisers, it is paid for by the people who watch it. So there's That's a lot more scrutiny, exactly. There's a lot more scrutiny on the BBC and for it to do things right. So they're really under the magnifying glass. Let's talk about the presenter in question. He's called Hugh Edwards. Um, he's a household name, but more than that, he's been you know, the front and centre of BBC News coverage for two decades at least. Um, he's presented things from election nights to uh, coronations to the Queen's funeral. He is the number one person who goes on air. And again, I guess that comes with a lot more scrutiny because the trusted face of the BBC for its news coverage, um, it seemingly, whether this is contractual or not, you need to have maybe people think a higher level um, of professionalism within your personal Be life as well. Be a good character. Exactly. So what we've seen over the last... Well, it feels like a long time, but it's only been a couple of days, um, is these allegations um, from the Sun newspaper that came out about um, a, a then unnamed um, news presenter, top news presenter of the BBC, uh, paying money in exchange for explicit photos from a 17-year-old. Um, they have since rode back on that idea that he paid this then minor, um, you know, in terms of being under 18, uh, for explicit photos. but. They still maintain that he acted unprofessionally yeah. um, and they gave this person tens of thousands of pounds. This unnamed person then went to buy drugs and his mother um, accuses the, the BBC presenter of basically fueling a drug habit. Yes. And since He's then, denied all these allegations, hasn't he? Since or then, we're not sure. We're not sure because he, we've only recently learnt of his, um, of, of his identity. Um, his wife has come out yesterday and said that this is the person and he's now in hospital. We know he's had a mental health um, issues and depression over the past, um, the past decades really. Um, so now we're in a position where we're not still quite sure as to, well we know at least in the moment that he, there's been nothing criminal that he's done. The police have been called in and said there's no criminal action that they want to take. He has been suspended. But he has been suspended and the BBC are now carrying out their investigation and yes. um, it calls into question many, many things about privacy, about what we expect of people in the public eye. He's obviously not um, a publicly elected official. It's not like he's working in government um, and it's kind of the crossover between... But we're between, paying his salary, aren't we? We are, but it's kind of the, the crossover between he hasn't done anything wrong criminally um, and where does it stop in terms of you could go over and find, you know, thousands of celebrities who are doing things that they shouldn't necessarily be doing is that something really that we the the, the press or is that what you know is that in the public interest for yes. us to go into the private lives of people and try and find out secrets so it seems more salacious really at this point than it does in the public interest which is what the sun um, are saying but it has been news fodder now 24 7 coverage we've had helicopters above the bbc yes. from all the other and obviously it's great for the the press and great for the competitors of the bbc because they can point the finger and say you know look what's going Get on here house and, in order and the bbc themselves I... will cover it um ad verbatim because and, and ad infinitum because that's what the bbc always does it. Yeah. it likes to cover itself and hold itself to scrutiny uh, more than anyone else. Then it's one way, whether you're talking about David Attenborough or the coverage of the Olympics or Wimbledon or, you know, it has a huge reputation, of course, the BBC, um, and it has done for, for a long time. And it's during the COVID pandemic, it was one of the trusted, yeah. the most trusted things that we have. People talk about the BBC and it comes with its own reputation. I think that's why it's held to a, a higher standard than most is because people expect it to be on another realm, on another level. This will definitely not help the broadcaster. We've had many scandals before. It's a huge employer. The BBC has tens of thousands of people working for it, but we had Jimmy Savile, lots of things in the past. Recently, uh, revelations about Princess Diana and how an interview was obtained, but they, they do stack up. Um, I think the BBC is doing its best, but there have been allegations or question marks about how it took so long for them to respond to this specific allegation. The, the mother came to the BBC months before this became a story. Um, they did try and contact her, but only twice in the coming months. But the BBC has many, many complaints every day to handle. And if they were to badger someone over and over again to try and get a response. So it's a really hard sort of balancing act for the BBC. Um, but at the moment, they're in a really difficult position because what do they do with this presenter? They've got um, to look after his welfare because he's in hospital with mental health issues. Um, they've also got to act appropriately because there's an investigation going into his conduct with uh, junior employees of the, uh, the corporation and other people outside it. So that it's a really hard 
you know, balancing act for them, what I'm sure will happen is that this story is not over. This will continue. And obviously, we haven't heard the presenter side of things yet. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Simon. Well, coming up on Channel's Business Global, Toby Akerile, the CEO of Giddy Real Estate Investment Limited, is one of a select group of individuals being recognized in the House of Lords this weekend at the 13th edition of the African Achievers Awards. I'll be talking to him about the reasons why he is being celebrated and I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. All of this after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Channel's Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka from our bureau here in London. In a moment, I'll be sharing an interview I conducted with the CEO of Giddy Real Estate, Toby Akerile. But until then, here's a breakdown of the biggest business news stories of the week. The UK economy contracted less than expected in May, with growth slowing as businesses stopped work for the extra bank holiday to celebrate the coronation of King Charles III. GDP fell 0.1% on the month, down from a growth of 0.2% in April. This is according to data released by the Office for National Statistics. Tesla is hiring a leader for its new retail electricity business as it looks to expand into the UK energy market. Tesla Electric currently sells power to consumers in select markets such as Texas and now the group is preparing to launch a retail electricity product in the UK. The listing for a UK head of operations seeks applicants that are comfortable with ambiguity and have a healthy scepticism of the status quo. The role is based in London and Manchester. Cristiano Ronaldo is to buy a stake in an online watch trading platform called Chrono24. The German-based firm, which recently held a $1 billion financing round, is yet to disclose the size of the Portuguese striker's stake. According to Deloitte, the market for second-hand watches is expected to expand 75% by the end of the decade, reaching almost 40 billion US dollars. Experts in the field anticipate the revenue of pre-owned timepieces could overtake sales of new watches by 2023. Now to our next story, the 13th edition of the African Achievers Awards will be taking place in the House of Lords here this weekend, hosted by British politician and activist Lord Simon Woolley. The ceremony celebrates excellence on the continent by recognising notable individuals and organisations across multiple sectors. Toby Akerile, the CEO of Giddy Real Estate Investment Limited, is one of those individuals being recognised and he joined me earlier in Westminster for a catch-up. Um, I feel so glad that I'm being noticed and uh... Uh, being the youngest is also a top of the iceberg for me. And uh, one thing I'm very happy about is that uh, it's Africans Achievers Award. It's, I'm, it means I'm doing something noticeable in Africa. And that's all it for me. I believe that I can do whatever I put my mind on. And also my love for Africa drives me a lot. Um, I travel to South Africa, to other big countries, Canada and the rest, and I see these things being done there. So I said, what? do we need to do in Nigeria for this to be possible? So we come together, young minds. Okay, currently the oldest individual in my company is, I think it's about 32, and we're doing this. So you're ageist? Ah, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now what we did, is our, we have this idea of young minds coming together to do things differently from what has been happening. So we call ourselves, we are not in the, just in the business of making money, we're in the business of discovery, we're in the business of disruption, when we are in the business of changing the narrative. So coming to the House of Lords, coming to the House of Parliament in the UK, I'm very, very glad, not just because I'm receiving an award, I'm glad because I'm receiving an award in the name Africa Achievers Award. We are not just only in Lagos, we are currently in Gambia. We are, we are doing real estate in Gambia and we are, because one of our biggest goals is we want to be in all Africa countries before we clock 10. And this is our second year. Now to our final story as parents prepare themselves for a busy and probably expensive school summer break. There are lots of questions being asked about the state of the current education system being taught here in Britain and across swathes of Africa. Late last month, I was joined in the studio by the founders of a new educational platform provider, which assists students with university placements, which offer industry specific training programs and work placements for young students. Samara Suleiman, a Dr. Marcus Market. Thank you so much for joining me in the Channel's Business Global Studio. I was just mentioning to you off air that education really has been a buzz terminology uh, since we've 
come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, not just here where we are in the global north, and we know that so many children lost um, hours, in fact, months of education, uh, but then also in the global south, particularly in Africa, lots of people were not able to go to school, but then industry experts began to examine what exactly are people studying? Because we know the world of work has changed so much. How has education and the way we train children evolved over the past few years? Okay, should I go for that? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us, first of all. So what's happened is uh, we found that there's been a major shift now. Uh, all levels of education have changed in the way that they deliver their syllabuses and curriculums. Uh, so everything has gone on to online, yeah. so we have hybrid learning and things like that. But what we found was a lot of, most of, well, the whole world stood still. So now we're trying to get uh, students mobile again and basically having exposure to international world uh, and different environments helps to build up those students. So what, we're what we found now is that industry is working more closely with the universities and education providers. Do you think it's important, Dr. Marcus, for industries to work with well, I think it's... Because you get a little bit of it. I remember kind of like if, you, if you're raised in the UK, maybe when you're year 10, you get a couple of weeks work experience in retail. If you were lucky, you'd go into a law firm or something. And then you don't really hear much and you're left to kind of scramble. There's a room, a careers advisor. You don't get much um, help, do you? Well, we believe industry is an indispensable, indispensable part yeah. of education. We believe industry should be... Uh, part and parcel of education from the school level to the university level. The problem that we are facing right now, especially in the Anglo-American system, is that the interaction with employers and industry starts after kids graduate from university. So in Germany, my country of origin, what happens is that employers and industry work directly with universities. So as a student at a university of applied science, you are required, not expected, required, to work as part of your studies. Um, so that way you get a lot of hands-on professional industry relevant experience. So we believe what we want to do as a mission is to spread that sort of German philosophy. And it's taken root in the UK as well, because what we saw here is that the British government introduced the T level, the technical yeah. levels, right? So that is industry input, uh, university input and then you essentially design a course that trains students mm. at university and at industry. Well, that's what, you know, the Germans have been doing for the past few hundred years. Uh, yeah. We never had the empire, so we had to sort of organically grow the strength. And that's that was what, really what have key. been the results of that? Have you seen that, that, you know, children or young professionals in Germany are doing better than uh, comparable uh, countries who are following a different method? So you can see that at the universities that we represent. So they have about 92% uh, of the students uh, having a job, uh, you know, e either before graduating or, or immediately after. Because there's so much demand also for, uh, for skilled uh, labor that industry really craves, uh, you know, those yes. young talents. And mind you, that's the industry that students have been working for as part of their studies. So they already know the employer and the employer knows what these students are capable of, right? So then they have to train them on the job because they've been trained as part of the educational journey. Yeah. Where, how, where else has this successfully been uh, doled out? We are very new as a company. So what we haven't done is spread our eggs into too many countries. So we are focusing on Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia mm. and Pakistan mm. because we feel that this is where the results can actually deliver and speak and then roll out to the other countries. Uh, we are in Oman, we're in China, we're in different countries. But this specific where we're trying to educate individuals who do come for education there's nothing wrong yes. with coming abroad, getting education, yes. getting exposure, because the levels of maturity and understanding which you gain when coming to these countries, uh, especially the work ethics, etc., and the the standards of Western, uh, which is the pole position, unfortunately. There's nothing wrong with coming here and getting that, but then taking those skills and going back to your country and allowing your country to benefit, that's what we're now trying to encourage. But it's no. been really fascinating uh, speaking with you. It's 
a, an incredibly important initiative, particularly uh, for Channels Business Global, because as I said, we've discussed, um, you know, what's happened to education and COVID-19 and African students yes. extensively over the past couple of years. And this is an absolutely great project that I do hope, uh, you know, the, the change makers listening yes. uh, will adopt <laughs> and adhere to. Samara Suleiman. And Dr. Marcus Market, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you for having us. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.